Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. John Iskander. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's edition of CDC's Public Health Grand Rounds. Uh, for those of you who are uh, regular Grand Rounds viewers, you, you don't have to adjust your broadband connection. You're, you're not seeing Dr. Popovich on a particularly bad hair day. Um, just wanted to remind all of our viewers that Grand Rounds is available for continuing education uh, credits. The information is listed on your screen. Um, over the past two years, uh, we have uh, provided continuing edu education credits to more than uh, 2,000 individuals through the Grand Rounds Forum. Uh, we're pleased to have the uh, collaboration of the outstanding CDC Library and Information Center, uh, as we always do, featuring um, science clips for those of you interested in uh, more information from the medical literature. Uh, Daphne Kani has served as our subject matter expert, uh, and that's available at cdc.gov slash science clips. We're also continuing to feature uh, Grand Rounds topics in the MMWR, and those are available at cdc.gov slash MMWR. Uh, over the next several months, we're pleased to feature for you a variety of um, interesting topics in chronic disease prevention and control, infectious disease control, and injury prevention. And there's one place to go to find everything about Grand Rounds. Uh, the Grand Rounds website, uh, which is listed on your screen. Um, so we have an outstanding panel for you today. Uh, I was looking on uh, PubMed a bit earlier. Our panel has a total of well over 100 uh, publications uh, in uh, alcohol aspects of uh, public health and prevention. Uh, I have one article to my credit as an academic editor, um, but what you don't see here is that I could not have achieved even that very small feat uh, without the CDC alcohol program team uh, pictured here who served as uh, peer reviewers and uh, served as my subject matter experts. Uh, so some of you may have noticed something that I noticed. <laughs> Captain Brewer. And so with that name, you may be wondering, so how committed is he really to this program? So I, I think this picture pretty much speaks for itself. Uh, and uh, um, with, with that, I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, CDC Director, uh, Dr. Thomas Frieden. As you'll hear today, excessive alcohol use is an under recognized and under-addressed public health problem. In fact, uh, some ongoing work in our surveillance epi lab uh, services unit has taken all of the community guide recommendations and looked at which are the ones for which there's the largest gap between what we recommend and what the world does. And alcohol control policy and alcohol prevention is right up there with the top. Now, Jeffrey Rose, in his book on preventive medicine, said the following, of all the threats to human health, it is alcohol which causes the widest range of injury. It shortens life, shrinks the brain and impairs the intellect, causes failure of the liver, heart, and peripheral nerves, contributes to depression, violence, and the breakup of personal and social life, and has been blamed for a quarter of all deaths on the road. And of course, there are other health and social impacts as well, ranging from myocardial infarction to hypertension to fetal alcohol syndrome, sudden infant death syndrome, and importantly, HIV. Although difficult to quantitate, risky sex following alcohol use is a major driver of the HIV epidemic, both in this country and globally. And that's particularly timely to mention because we have here at CDC for this week our global AIDS program, uh, several hundred CDC employees, including locally engaged staff from around the world, work on PEPFAR and other priority public health programs here for a week, and many of them are listening in to this session. So think about the importance of addressing problem alcohol use, 
to address many, many of the public health problems that we wish to make progress on, ranging from the injury to the infectious disease to the non-communicable disease. In the U.S., alcohol is a cause of about 80,000 deaths a year and over $200 billion a year in lost productivity, an estimate of $1.90 for every drink consumed. This is uh, a dangerous and preventable problem, but one for which we have made limited progress in the past 15 years. This session is going to explore the public health impact of excessive alcohol use and the factors that contribute to it, particularly marketing to youth. Uh, speakers will discuss some of the evidence-based strategies to prevent harmful use of al alcohol and look at the state and local level, where, as is often the case, uh, the most rapid and innovative uh, means of making progress may first be manifest. So I want to thank the speakers for being part of this session. I look forward to hearing it. It's now my pleasure to introduce the CDC Alcohol Program Lead, Captain Bob Brewer. Well, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And yes, that really is the license plate on my car. Um, I lead the uh, CDC Alcohol Program, and I will be talking with you today about the public health impact of excessive drinking, present a few key points about the epidemiology of binge drinking, and then briefly discuss recommendations for the prevention of excessive alcohol use. As Dr. Frieden said, excessive drinking has a huge public health impact. We estimate that excessive drinking kills approximately 80,000 people in the U.S. each year and shortens the lives of those who die by an average of 30 years resulting in about 2.3 million years of potential life lost each year. This makes excessive drinking the third leading preventable cause of death in the United States. It is also very expensive. As Dr. Frieden noted, we estimate that excessive drinking costs the U.S. $223.5 billion in 2006, or about $1.90 per drink, and over 40% of that cost, or about 80 cents per drink, was paid by government. So in effect, we are all subsidizing the cost of excessive drinking. Binge drinking is responsible for over half the deaths due to excessive drinking, two thirds of the years of potential life lost, and three quarters of the economic costs. Binge drinking is defined as the consumption of four or more drinks on an occasion by a woman, five or more drinks on an occasion by a man. Binge drinking generally leads to acute impairment is by far the most common pattern of excessive drinking in the U.S. and is reported by about 90% of excessive drinkers. Binge drinking is associated with many serious health and social problems. Dr. Frieden also mentioned some of these. They include motor vehicle crashes, interpersonal violence, HIV and other STDs, and unintended pregnancy. This slide shows information on binge drinking among U.S. adults in 1993 2001 and 2009, and is based on data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. There was a slight increase in the prevalence of binge drinking in 2009, but it has really changed very little overall during this time period. In contrast, binge drinking episodes increased 29% from 1.2 billion to 1.5 billion during the 1990s, and has stayed at or above this level since then. Annual per capita episodes of binge drinking also increased about 17% from 6.3 to 7.4 episodes per person per year during the 1990s, <clears throat> excuse me, and has changed very little since then. While many people think that binge drinking is predominantly a problem for underage youth and college students, it is actually a major public health problem across the lifespan. About one in four high school students and adults age 18 to 34 years reported binge drinking in the past month during 2009. Youth who binge drink may continue to engage in this behavior into adulthood, and adults who binge drink may encourage youth to do so by the example they set. In contrast to some other leading health risk behaviors, the prevalence of binge drinking actually increases significantly with household income. In short, people with more money tend to drink more. This could reflect the fact that binge drinking has not been the focus of intense population-based prevention efforts and is therefore not widely recognized as a health risk by groups who would otherwise usually be early adopters of healthy behaviors. 
Binge drinkers report engaging in this behavior about four times a month. However, the frequency of binge drinking is actually higher among binge drinkers aged 65 years and older than among those aged 18 to 44. The average intensity of binge drinking is about eight drinks per occasion and is well above the cut points used to define this behavior for men and women and among adults of all ages. This is particularly concerning because the risk of alcohol attributable harms increases with the number of drinks consumed per occasion. Given the high frequency and intensity of binge drinking among adults, it may be surprising that most of these drinkers are not alcohol dependent. This slide is based on a study done by uh, New Mexico by Jim Roper, one of our co-panelists here today, and colleagues using state BRSS data. Note that over 90% of binge drinkers did not meet criteria for alcohol dependence. While alcohol dependence is an important public health problem, these findings emphasize the larger problem of excessive drinking. The prevalence and intensity of binge drinking also varies across states. This slide shows the age-adjusted prevalence of binge drinking among U.S. adults by state in 2010. The dark-colored states had the highest prevalence of binge drinking. They were generally clustered in the Midwest and New England, but also included D.C., Alaska, and Hawaii. In contrast, the intensity was highest in the southern mountain states and Midwest, and included some states such as Louisiana, New Mexico, and Utah that had a lower prevalence of binge drinking. This shows that the problem of binge drinking is broadly distributed geographically in the U.S. While we have been primarily talking about excessive drinking by adults, drinking by adults and youth are closely related. Youth tend to model their drinking behavior after adults, and adults are often the source of the alcohol consumed by youth. Furthermore, most alcohol control policies in states affect the drinking behavior of adults and youth. Still, youth and adults who binge drink differ somewhat in the types of beverages they consume. Half of the high school students who binge drink usually consume liquor. In contrast, 74% of adults who binge drink drink beer either exclusively or predominantly as their beverage of choice. There are several intervention strategies for preventing excessive drinking recommended by the community guide. They are based on systematic reviews of the scientific literature done by community guide scientists in consultation with subject matter experts both inside and outside CDC. Recommendations on intervention effectiveness are made, then made by the independent, non-federal Community Preventive Services Task Force based on the strength of the scientific evidence on intervention effectiveness. Here are the strategies that are currently recommended by the Community Preventive Services Task Force. In general, these interventions deal with increasing the price and limiting the availability of alcoholic beverages. I will highlight the findings for the first three interventions. Jim Mosier will then discuss legal issues related to their implementation and the status of tax and dram shop policies in states. Overall, a 10% increase in the price of alcoholic beverages would be expected to reduce alcohol consumption by about 7%. Tax increases result in price increases, and subsequent reductions in excessive drinking would be expected to be proportional to the size of the tax increase. Alcohol outlet density refers to the concentration of alcohol retailers in a particular geographic area. A higher concentration of retail alcohol outlets is associated with increased alcohol consumption and related harms. It is also worth noting that most of the studies we reviewed assess the impact of relaxing controls on alcohol outlet density, reflecting the general trend toward the deregulation of alcohol sales. Commercial host or dram shop liability allows alcohol retailers to be held liable for harms caused by their intoxicated or underage patrons. Although commercial host liability varies substantially across states, these laws can help reduce alcohol-related harms and alcohol-related medical conditions. For example, motor vehicle crashes were reduced about 6% in locations with these laws compared to those that did not have them. Despite the public health impact of excessive drinking and the availability of many evidence-based strategies to address it, there remains numerous challenges to mo uh, mobilizing an adequate public health response to excessive alcohol use. These include the misperception 
that excessive drinking is only a problem among youth, the lack of attention to policy and environmental factors that significantly influence drinking behavior, and the limited public health capacity at the federal, state, and local levels to inform community prevention activities. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Jernigan. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is David Jernigan. I'm the uh, I'm an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the director of the Center on Alcohol Marketing and Youth. Let me reinforce some of the data about youth and drinking. Alcohol is the most commonly used drug among young people. In 2010, there were approximately 10 million underage drinkers between the ages of 12 and 20 in the U.S., 6.5 million of whom report binge drinking. Alcohol is also a key factor in the leading causes of death among 12 to 20 year olds, unintentional injuries, homicide, and suicide. Every day, 4,500 young people in the U.S. start drinking, and every year, we lose 4,700 young people because of alcohol use. The prevalence of binge drinking among male high school students has declined since 1991, but has remained largely unchanged among females. As a result, about one in four high school students report binge drinking in the past 30 days. And this is likely to be a substantial underestimate of actual alcohol consumption in this population. A growing body of studies has followed groups of young people over time. These studies have generally found that the more young people are exposed to alcohol advertising, the more likely they are to start drinking, or if already drinking, to drink more. Various forms of alcohol advertising and marketing that predict drinking onset among youth are listed here. And I will discuss youth exposure to magazine, television, and radio advertising shortly. The key problem is that the alcohol industry's own self-regulatory codes are the principal way that young people are protected from alcohol advertising. These codes cover both content, what's in the ads, and placement what age audiences will see, hear, or read them. Regulating content is very difficult. Content is subjective, it raises First Amendment issues, and it disappears quickly, particularly in digital media. One example of a self-regulatory provision is from the Distilled Spirits Code. These ads are not supposed to have indecent images, but they frequently use sex appeal to market alcohol. Unlike content, ad placement what audiences see, hear, or read the advertising can be measured, at least in traditional media. By 2003, the wine, beer, and distilled spirits industries had all agreed to advertise only where people under 21 comprise less than 30% of the audience. The National Research Council and Institute of Medicine in 2003 and 24 state attorneys general in 2011 called for a stricter standard because 12 to 20 year olds are the group most at risk of underage drinking. They are less than 15% of the population. So the industry's 30% standard allows them to be exposed at more than double the rate of the rest of the population. A 15% standard based on persons aged 12 to 20 in the audience would more effectively prevent overexposure of this vulnerable group. Self-regulation requires an independent monitor. And since 2002, the Center on Alcohol Marketing and Youth, or CAMI, funded by CDC since 2009, has been that monitor. It uses media industry standard data sources to monitor compliance with industry placement standards and to compare youth to adult exposure. We found, for example, that in 2008, youth ages 12 to 20 compared to adults 21 and over saw 10% more beer ads. 16% more ads for alcohol pops like Smirnoff Ice and Bacardi Silver, and 73% fewer ads for wine in magazines. Most, 79% of youth exposure occurred in magazines with disproportionate youth audiences. In 2009, there were 315,581 alcohol product commercials on US television, and youth were more likely per capita than adults to have seen more than 67,000 of these ads. The average TV watching youth saw 366 alcohol ads on television alone, an average about an ad a day. Nearly 24,000 of these ads were placed in violation of the industry's voluntary 30% threshold. 
and youth exposure to alcohol ads on television is growing more rapidly than adult or young adult exposure. On radio, we were able to get data for 75 local markets for 2009, covering about 42.5% of the U.S. population ages 12 and above. 9% of the placements violated the 30% standard, and nearly a third played on programming youth were more likely to hear than adults, and generated more than half of youth exposure. This slide shows a tool on the CAMI website where users can put in their media market and see the local results. Monitoring must occur at the brand level because different alcohol brands pursue different advertising strategies. A small number of beer and distilled spirits brands, less than 10% is responsible for at least half of all youth exposure by medium. Monitoring across media is also critical. For instance, while youth exposure has been falling in magazines, it's been rising on television. As you can see, the adoption of the 30% standard in 2003 had little impact. There are limitations to our monitoring activities. The survey data we use is based on consumer self-reports of exposure, which may be inaccurate, but which help form the basis for alcohol company decisions about where and when they advertise. We cannot link brand-specific ad exposure with youth alcohol consumption because data are not available on youth alcohol consumption by brand. And alcohol companies are moving away from traditional towards digital media, which cannot be assessed using the traditional methods we've used. For example, while companies like Nielsen can provide demographic information for Facebook as a whole, such information is not available for Facebook pages hosted by individual alcohol brands. Much of digital alcohol marketing is created by users and is spread virally, making it difficult, difficult to control. Young people and the alcohol companies are both early adopters of these new technologies. Our center has found that alcohol brands have amassed millions of likes or fans on Facebooks, and their pages have tens of thousands of photos and videos posted by both the brands and users. Facebook illustrates many of the problems posed by alcohol marketing in digital media. Age gating, assessing the age of users of the site, is imperfect. Facebook requires alcohol companies to register as such and to block access to their pages by users with a Facebook age below 21. But an estimated third of minors on Facebook are there with false ages, and persons between the ages of 18 and 20 can change their Facebook age in just a few clicks. Age gating also only applies to the alcohol brand pages, not user-generated pages, using branded and trademarked alcohol marketing content. We know young people are on the alcohol brand's Facebook pages because we can see the photos of themselves that they have posted there. What can be done to reduce youth exposure to alcohol marketing? We need to maintain the monitoring of industry activities in traditional media. Exposure standards need to be complied with and strengthened. The 30% standard permits disproportionate exposure of underage youth. The Federal Trade Commission has asked for a 25% standard, and one company, Beam Incorporated, has adopted it. The National Research Council, Institute of Medicine, and 24 state attorneys general have called for the 15% standard, and our modeling of 15% found it would reduce youth exposure, save the industry money, and have virtually no effect on the industry's ability to reach young adults, its often stated target for this advertising. The Federal Trade Commission could collect and report annually on alcohol industry spending on marketing, just as it does for tobacco marketing. Companies and media outlets should tighten their age gating, especially in digital media. And companies should, as the FTC recommended in 1999, establish no-buy lists committing not to advertise on programs and in venues where youth overexposure is likely. Public health has an important role to play and can inform efforts to reduce youth exposure to alcohol marketing by, for instance, restricting outdoor alcohol advertising near schools, churches, and on public transit where young people are likely to be present, restricting alcohol ads on retail outlet windows, and banning alcohol advertising on state-owned property, including institutions of higher education. Our next speaker is Jim Mosier. Good afternoon. 
My name is Jim Mosier, and I am the president of Alcohol Policy Consultations, a private consulting firm, as well as the senior policy advisor at the CDM Group, Inc. I will describe the structure of, the alcohol, of alcohol regulation in the United States, provide examples of policies that have been shown to be effective, and discuss the challenges and opportunities associated with their implementation. Alcoholic beverages are the only consumer products specifically mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. The 21st Amendment, which repealed prohibition, grants states a substantial role in regulating the alcohol trade with greater authority than applied to other consumer products. In practice, while not required, states generally defer to the federal government regarding regulations of alcohol manufacturing and marketing. States have concurrent authority in these areas. Alcohol taxes are an exception, as all states, as well as the federal government, impose alcohol taxes. States focus primarily on the retail sector of the industries. All states require commercial retailers to obtain a license or are operated by the states themselves. There are two kinds of regulations. For new alcohol outlets, where, how many, and what kinds of retail outlets are permitted in the state. For retail operations generally, many areas are covered, such as prohibitions on sales of intoxicated and underage persons, and restrictions on hours and days of sale. As you heard from Dr. Brewer, many of the community guide recommendations address these two categories. States may delegate some or most of their authority to local governments, allowing localities to impose regulations that are stricter than required by the state law. State preemption is the legal term for describing the extent to which a state limits this local authority. There are four categories of state preemption. Some states, including New York and Texas, have exclusive or near-exclusive preemption, relegating local governments to an advisory role in the licensing and regulation process. Many states have exclusive state licensing, such as California and Iowa, but allow local governments to regulate retail outlets through local zoning and police powers. Many states, including Georgia and Colorado, have joint licensing. A retail outlet may obtain both state, must obtain both state and local government licenses. A small number of states, including Wisconsin, Nevada, and Hawaii, turn the licensing authority over to local governments. New York has strong state preemption, not allowing cities to use either licensing or zoning authority to regulate alcohol outlets. In a 22-year period, the state licensing authority issued 358 new licenses in New York City's Lower East Side. This area is now experiencing widespread alcohol problems related to this high concentration of alcohol outlets. The state preemption doctrine is a critical challenge to enacting and enforcing effective alcohol policy measures. In general, the policy interventions endorsed by the community guide, as well as marketing controls, have potentially adverse effects on commercial interests who often have considerable influence with Congress and state legislators. However, they have less influence at local at, on local communities because of the increased access that local citizens and public health and law enforcement professionals have to policymakers. All states, as well as the federal government, impose alcohol taxes. Most states preempt local authority to impose alcohol taxes. There's strong scientific evidence showing that the effectiveness showing the effectiveness of increasing alcohol taxes for reducing excessive alcohol consumption and related harms. Yet, alcohol taxes at the federal and state levels have been steadily and substantially decreasing over the last four decades. Here you can see the decline in federal alcohol taxes since 1970 for distilled spirits, beer, and wine. This decline is caused by the fact that alcohol taxes are most often imposed based on volume, such as a dollar per gallon. As such, alcohol tax rates tend to decrease over time unless legislators adjust them periodically to at least keep up with the pace of inflation. State taxes are also decreasing over time for the same reason as shown here for the average beer tax rate. These decreases have come in spite of public support for increasing alcohol taxes, a topic I will discuss later. Case, dem case studies demonstrate that the primary barrier to alcohol tax increases is the powerful commercial lobbies that oppose such taxes. In general, controls of alcohol retail outlets are also er eroding over time. 
For example, last year, Georgia enacted legislation that allows municipalities to repeal the state's Sunday alcohol sales bans. Many other states have enacted similar repeals. Restrictions on the number, types, and location of alcohol outlets are also being repealed or loosened. Unfortunately, public health and law enforcement groups do not consider alcohol regula regulation to be a high priority. As a result, many deregulation proposals face little or no opposition from public health constituencies. An added challenge is the ratchet effect that frequently occurs with deregulation. Once instituted, changes in state regulations are very hard to reverse because new economic stakeholders are established. At the end of Prohibition, 18 states created control systems where the state owned or oper and operated wholesale and retail alcohol businesses. These systems have been systematically deregulated, turning parts of their operations over to private licensees. As this map shows, of the 18 control states, six states have privatized most or all of their state retail system, and five states have active privatization proposals. Commercial host or dram shop liability provides yet another example of this deregulatory trend. Courts began imposing commercial host liability in the 1970s and 1980s. In response to concerns raised by commercial interests, many, states, many state legislatures enacted laws to limit the court rulings by imposing significant barriers that make bringing commercial host cases more difficult. This slide documents the increasing number of legislative barriers in place in the 50 states in 1989 and 2011. Nevertheless, progress is being made in implementing community guide recommended alcohol control policies. Illinois is one of the few states that does not preempt local alcohol taxation. Both the city of Chicago and Cook County, where Chicago is located, impose alcohol taxes. Cook County doubled its alcohol taxes effective the first of this year. Chicago and Cook County municipal governments have enacted four alcohol tax increases since 2005. Chicago residents pay both taxes, as shown here. Clearly, if public health constituencies organize to support effective alcohol control policies, positive changes can be made, particularly at the local level. In response to a broad-based coalition campaign, Maryland enacted a special 3% alcohol sales tax in 2011, and the raised revenue has been dedicated to social services programs. This campaign may provide a model for similar efforts in other states. Opinion Works, a public interest research and communications firm, conducted a poll to determine public support for the Maryland tax proposal. The results were disseminated to legislators to demonstrate that voters strongly supported increasing alcohol taxes, particularly if the funds were used for health initiatives. These findings are consistent with the findings of polls done in other locations and show that there is often strong public support for evidence-based alcohol control policies, such as increasing alcohol excise taxes. There are also many state and local campaigns across the country that are attempting to regulate alcohol outlet density, another one of the community guide recommended strategies. In conclusion, Implementing alcohol policy reforms is feasible and has potential for significant public health gains. Public health constituencies can play an instrumental role in assessing and disseminating scientific findings, educating decision makers and key constituencies, providing expertise to state and local co coalitions, and conducting evaluations to determine effectiveness of interventions. Our next speaker will be Jim Rober. Good afternoon, my name is Jim Rober and I'm the alcohol epidemiologist in this, with the New Mexico Department of Health. Today I'll talk about the epidemiology of alcohol attributable problems in New Mexico and some of the steps we've taken in recent years to implement community guide recommendations to reduce excessive drinking and related harms. I will end with some lessons learned that could be useful to the public health authorities in other states and localities. Excessive alcohol consumption is an important public health problem in New Mexico as it is throughout the United States. This slide shows trends in alcohol attributable death rates in New Mexico and the U.S. from 1990 through 2007. 
Throughout this period, New Mexico's AAD rate has ranged from 1.5 to 1.9 times the U.S. rate and has been among the highest in the country. New Mexico's AAD rate increased about 11% during this time, while the U.S. rate fe actually fell slightly. Much of this increase has been due to an increase in deaths due to alcohol attributable injuries, which are due to binge drinking. There are also substantial disparities in AAD rates in New Mexico. American Indians comprise about 10% of New Mexico's population and have the highest alcohol attributable death rate. While their rates are somewhat lower than the rates for American Indians, white Hispanics and white non-Hispanics, each of whom com comprise about 40% of New Mexico's total population, also have high rates of alcohol attributable deaths. American Indians report higher intensity binge drinking than either Hispanic or white non-Hispanics, which puts them at greater risk of both alcohol attributable injuries and chronic conditions. White Hispanics and white non-Hispanics also have a high prevalence of consuming over 10 drinks per binge episode, placing themselves and others at substantially increased risk of alcohol attributable harms. To learn more about binge drinking in New Mexico, the state implemented a six question binge drinking module in the 2004 state B BRFSS survey. Here are the findings on binge drinking by location for 2004. Roughly 170,000 New Mexico adults reported binge drinking during the past month. Of these, about 24,000 reported drinking in a bar or club during their most recent binge drinking episode. Of those who drank in bars and clubs, one in four, or about 6,000 binge drinkers per month, drove after their most recent binge drinking episode. Furthermore, about one third of the binge drinkers who drove after drinking in a bar or club, roughly 2,000 per month, reported consuming 10 or more drinks before driving. This suggests that some bars were serving alcohol to persons who were intoxicated, which is illegal in New Mexico as it is in most states uh, and in most states in the US. These findings were used to support the implementation of an aggressive campaign against binge drinking and alcohol impaired driving, including, including changes in New Mexico's liquor control regulations. I will now briefly describe this campaign. New Mexico's campaign to reduce binge drinking, alcohol impaired driving, and alcohol impaired motor vehicle crash deaths began in 2005. One component of the campaign focused on reducing alcohol service to underage youth and to persons who were already intoxicated, also known as over service, in licensed alcohol establishments where persons were allowed to drink on site, such as bars and restaurants. Before the start of the prevention campaign, New Mexico had already established a clear legal definition of over-service. If the patron of a retail alcohol establishment, such as a bar, is found to have a blood alcohol content, or BAC, of 0.14 grams per deciliter or higher, which is almost twice the legal blood alcohol level for driving, within 90 minutes of consuming their last drink at a retail alcohol establishment, this BAC can be used as presumptive evidence as of intoxication at time of sale, and the licensee can be cited for over-service. However, before the campaign, New Mexico licensees were allowed to have five illegal sales and service violations per year before losing their liquor license. As a result, no New Mexico liquor license had ever been revoked for liquor law violations. To address this problem, the state's Alcohol Beverage Control Agency proposed to reduce the number of illegal sales and service violations required for license revocation from five to three violations a year. This came to be known in New Mexico as the Three Strikes Regulation. New Mexico also implemented community guide recommended strategies for reducing alcohol impaired driving, including sobriety checkpoints and a media campaign that warned drivers about the increased enforcement of laws against alcohol impaired driving. The Three Strikes Regulation was approved in the summer of 2006 and went into effect in October 2006. This was followed by a period of enhanced liquor control law enforcement, which led to a substantial increase in citations for illegal sales and service to intoxicated persons and minors. 
Comparing the six-month period before the regulatory change to the six-month period following the change, citations for illegal sales to intoxicated persons increased by more than 260%. Citations for illegal sales to minors increased by 43%. This enhanced liquor control law enforcement led, in 2008, to the first license revocations for illegal sales and service in New Mexico history. In addition to implementing community guide strategies to reduce excessive drinking, New Mexico also implemented community guide recommend, re recommended strategies for reducing alcohol impaired driving. These included regularly scheduled super blitz periods of increased DWI law enforcement, which deployed sobriety checkpoints around the state, and a comprehensive media campaign warning drivers about this increased DWI law enforcement. This media campaign included both media, TV spots, radio PSAs, and billboards, and news reports. Both super blitz DWI law enforcement and supporting media activity are ongoing priorities in New Mexico. As shown in this slide, there were some important changes in binge drinking and alcohol impaired driving during the two year period before these in interventions took full effect, that is 2004 to 2005, and the two year period after these in interventions were fully implemented, or 2007 to 2008. First, the intensity of binge drinking decreased 16% among binge drinkers who drank in bars and clubs, from 8.3 drinks to to 7.0 drinks on their last binge occasion. Second, the intensity of binge drinking decreased 19% among binge drinkers who drove after their most recent binge drinking episode. Third, the overall prevalence of alcohol impaired driving decreased by one third with a slightly greater reduction among males. Furthermore, after a decade of little to no change, the death rate from alcohol impaired motor vehicle crashes decreased 39% from 2004 to 2008. This moved New Mexico's death rate from alcohol impaired motor vehicle crashes from among the highest in the country to near the national median, which we see as important progress. Although other factors may have contributed to this decline, we believe these findings are strong presumptive evidence that the implementation of community guide recommendations for preventing excessive drinking and alcohol impaired driving in New Mexico helped reduce binge drinking, alcohol impaired driving, and harms related to them. In closing, I'd like to share a few lessons learned. Policy challenges can be addressed and pro progress can be made in reducing excessive drinking in states. Comprehensive prevention programs can reduce excessive drinking, related risk behaviors, and downstream consequences. And finally, well-designed and well-managed prevention efforts that focus on community guide recommendations can reduce alcohol-related problems in states. Thanks for the opportunity to share New Mexico's recent experience, and we look forward to your comments and questions. All right, well, and we do look forward to your comments and questions. Um, we would ask, though, that uh, if you have questions, please step up to the microphone, or those of you who have microphones in front of you, please use those. And we'd ask that you please limit your questions to one per person. And as someone who sometimes is accused of being a little verbose, we'd encourage you to keep them kind of brief. So um, any questions in the, uh, from the audience? Please. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Has there been, uh, has there been any uh, studies in the minorities or hard to reach population or population who doesn't speak English? And has there been any uh, uh, data showing the prevalence of drinking there? And if, if any programs have been you know, tailored toward this population, hard to reach population, um, uh, to, to kind of uh, reduce their uh, rate of uh, you know, abuse drinking? Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to maybe summarize that a little bit as uh, asking a question about studies done looking at disparities, differences in binge drinking across different populations, and then targeting of interventions towards some of those high-risk groups. Um, I'll, I'll give a, a brief response and then invite others on the panel here to uh, respond as well. 
and Jim Rober might want to respond in particular um, with regard to the American Indian Alaska Native population. Short answer is yes, there have been a lot of studies that have been done looking at risk factors as well as health outcomes across various racial and ethnic groups. The one point, though, that I would make is, again, to reiterate one of the findings that I presented, which is that um, in contrast to other risk behaviors, the issue of disparities is a little bit different for excessive drinking, and that we don't find the usual high risk groups that we would for tobacco or increasingly now for obesity. Highest prevalence of binge drinking, for example, as I pointed out, is actually among people who have higher household incomes. We find higher rates of binge drinking among people who are white. Um, now, that is by no means to say that it is not a huge public health problem for other high risk groups. We know, for example, Hispanics tend to have high rates of binge drinking. Um, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and again, Jim may want to comment on that. But the other thing that I, I would point out, and we highlighted this in the Vital Signs report that, uh, that Daphne Kinney and our group uh, first authored earlier this year, uh, when you start to drill down and look at other measures of binge drinking in, a different, in addition to prevalence, you start to see some different patterns emerging. And so, for example, you start to see African Americans having higher intensity binge drinking, Hispanics having higher intensity binge drinking, and Jim alluded to that as well. So that's one of the reasons why we really emphasize from a surveillance perspective not just looking at prevalence, but also drilling down and looking at other measures. Would other members of the panel like to comment on that a little bit? Jim, do you want to talk about it a little bit uh, from the standpoint of your findings in New Mexico? Well, I think the, the, um, the recent findings that we're most interested in uh, are, are the findings that I presented on intensity of binge drinking, which uh, showed pretty dramatic differences um, across uh, racial groups that mirror the, the disparities that we find in, in alcohol attributable outcomes. Um, so I, I think um, certainly I think one of our challenges is to, is to find uh, interventions that uh, address those disparities um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. In terms of interventions, the one that I'd like to highlight is uh, alcohol outlet densities. What we find in the research is that communities, uh, uh, racial communities, ethnic communities tend to have higher concentrations of outlets. It tends to be a much bigger problem in low income areas, but the low, uh, the rate that it's both uh, ethnic and income. In other words, uh, low-income neighborhoods that are primarily white have lower uh, alcohol outlet densities in general than uh, ethnic communities, including Asian and Pacific Islanders out in California. Um, and the, it, it demonstrates that some of these problems also interact with economic issues because in low-income communities there tends to be less uh, money available to invest in other types of retail outlets uh, and so alcohol outlets are a low capital business. You don't need a whole lot of money to open an alcohol store. Um, and that is one of the reasons because of the redlining by insurance industries and, and uh, banks makes the money less available. So you end up having more liquor stores serving not just as liquor stores but as the, the neighborhood bank and the neighborhood uh, grocery store. Um, and, this, uh, and, and this is in spite of the fact that as Bob said, uh, the excessive drinking rates of these populations are lower than the higher income areas. Dr. Fried? Perhaps Dr. Jernigan or others on the panel could comment on the prevalence of uh, harmful drinking globally, what the patterns are and what some of the potential interventions may be as this may relate to our, our audience which is weighted to the global uh, area at this point. Sure. Uh, globally, um, uh, alcohol worldwide is the number three uh, cause of uh, the global number th the third largest preventable risk factor in the global burden of disease, um, and it is uh, in the middle income countries. Uh, it's actually number one, uh, and this relates to the income effect that Bob talked about. Poverty is actually a protective factor against excessive alcohol use, um, but it's also rapidly rising in the low income countries. Um, and the interventions uh, were really pleased that the World Health Organization in 2010 adopted a global strategy to reduce alcohol-related harm, and it's got 10 areas, but the three best buys uh, identified in that strategy line up very well with the uh, community guide strategies. They are reducing physical availability, increasing the price of alcohol, and uh, restricting or reducing the marketing of alcohol. 
If I can also just add on one other point, I mean, you're talking about um, the economic development and a connection between economic development. I mean, one of the horrible tragedies with excessive drinking that the years of potential life loss figure that I presented highlights is the extent to which excessive drinking is really snuffing people out in the prime of their life. And a large proportion of the deaths that we see in the United States, alcohol triple deaths, are in the 20 to 64 age group, for example. And that plays in, of course, to the, the economic cost of excessive uh, alcohol consumption as well. Yeah, yes. I mean, when you look at it in a less resourced society perspective, this is a major threat to human capital development um, because it does tend to strike harder in the more educated uh, and wealthier segment of the population, the population that's rising uh, in terms of ability to move development forward uh, is the one at highest risk. Yes, please. I have, I guess, a follow-up um, comment. I'm Peter Kelmarx. I'm the country director in CDC Zimbabwe, and we've been working together with, with a colleague from SAMHSA supporting, we provide a tactical assistance for the alcohol policy in Zimbabwe that's currently under review in cabinet, and also hosted a, uh, an implementation planning meeting uh, for that policy. I, I would note that WHO has identified Eastern and Southern Africa as the region with the, among drinkers, the highest proportion of dangerous drinkers. and. We're very interested from our perspective in the Division of Global HIV AIDS uh, because of the strong links, as, as has been mentioned, with risky sex, um, with alcohol misuse, but also with poor adherence to HIV treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering just in, I guess, in, in follow-up to ask uh, Captain Brewer, is there um, plans for more um, support for our global programs for alcohol policy or, or alcohol activities? Well, we would love to do more globally. I, I must say, at this point, we're, we're a little bit stretched for resources to reach out globally as much as we would like. We have been involved in uh, some of the discussions around the non-communicable diseases strategy in particular, and some of the, uh, and the inclusion of an alcohol measure in that non-communicable diseases strategy. Uh, we have also been in touch with the Division of HIV AIDS, particularly around efforts to try to improve public health surveillance, to look more closely at the relationship between excessive drinking, binge drinking in particular, drinking to an, the point of intoxication, risky sexual behavior, and then HIV risk. Uh, but would love to have some more conversations with you all about ways that we can help. David, did you want to talk anything more about the work in Africa or particularly sure. the well, nexus with I'm HIV? on the board of an organization called the Global Alcohol Policy Alliance. That is the uh, coalition of uh, non-governmental groups around the world that are working on these issues. We just had the first Global Alcohol Policy Conference in uh, Thailand. We're hoping to be doing those on a two-year, uh, every two years. Um, and I'm also an advisor to a project in Africa that's looking at alcohol marketing in Africa. I did my dissertation field work in part in Zimbabwe, so there was a lot to study. Um, but one of the things, I mean, the, the questioner's uh, question is so well taken because the resources issue um, in the U.S. is a problem, but globally it's even worse, and uh, far too often the alcoholic beverage industry is actually filling the vacuum left by a lack of public health resources, sending their own public health experts in uh, to advise countries on uh, their national alcohol policies. And as I wrote in an article in the American Journal of Public Health in January, the list of policies that the industry promotes for national alcohol policies conspicuously excludes the three best buys that I mentioned, taxes, physical availability restrictions, and marketing restrictions. Yes. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> thanks for a great session. This is really good. Um, I wonder if any of you could speak to biology, biological plausibility, mechanisms, anything like that, that because you're, you're presenting very interesting epidemiology that's different from some of the other behavior, behavioral risk um, entities we have. So biology, I wonder if you could mention anything about that. And maybe you can tell me a little bit more about what you have in mind. Are you talking about the relationship between excessive consumption and impairment? Right. Or? And okay. mechanisms. I mean, the, it seems to me that alcohol use is, is prevalent, obviously, but excessive alcohol use that you're addressing here, is there a biological mechanism that's driving this in certain types of people, certain groups of people? Okay. So you're talking about a biological predisposition yeah, exactly. to, to abuse alcohol. Um, you know, I think that there, there certainly are differences in the way that, 
different segments of the population, different population groups may respond to alcohol. And there have been a lot of studies looking at the relationship between uh, genetics, for example, family history of alcohol dependence, and future risk of developing alcohol dependence. That's specifically talking about the disease of, of alcohol dependence or addiction. Um, but honestly, I, I think what public health can bring to the table that is perhaps a little bit different is a recognition of the importance of social and contextual issues on people's drinking behavior. And you know that's, that's very similar to what we've learned over the years about smoking, what we, of course, are learning about diet and physical activity, which is that the environment matters. And it matters whether or not alcohol is cheap and readily available and heavily advertised. That does influence people's drinking behavior. So yes, you've got individual differences in, in drinking behavior and perhaps vulnerability, but um, those, those vulnerabilities are going to be influenced substantially by the environment within which people are making their drinking decisions. And from a public health standpoint, I think that's where we can really make the greatest difference. And unfortunately, as Jim Mosier pointed out, most of the indices are going in the wrong direction. You know? So even if there are differences in, in vulnerability, I would argue that that would say that we ought to do everything we can to protect those who are most vulnerable to abusing alcohol. So, question. Uh, Bob, we have a question from a remote uh, viewer. Um, and this m may be for Jim Mosher. Uh, what would be uh, the expected impact of uh, privatizing alcohol sales in states that currently operate uh, state stores? Well, it happens at the community. It happens that the community guide just issued its uh, findings on the impact of privatization. I don't have those figures in my head. But uh, it, it's available on the web now, their report, and it's a substantial increase in consumption and problems can be anticipated. Uh, Washington State uh, passed an initiative uh, just last year. Uh, they're in the process of privatizing all their stores right now. Uh, and so we'll have yet another case study uh, of the impact of privatization. We've had, unfortunately, many, much of this research we do is studying uh, what happens when we go the wrong way. Um, and uh, uh, we can expect in Washington that this will have a pretty negative effect in terms of public health outcomes. Uh, actually, let me put, I wonder if that's one of our co-authors who asked that, um, because the <laughs> paper actually just came out. So, um, no, I just put a number on this. It's, it's a 43% increase in per capita alcohol consumption following privatization. It's, it's largely an availability story. I mean, essentially what you're doing is you're going from a situation where you have government-run retail liquor stores, and you're, you're privatizing that. So in some of the states that we looked at, privatization around, for example, wine, wine sales, and thinking of the state of Iowa as one example, they went from having about 200 locations where you could purchase wine to about 800 locations virtually overnight. And so when you make alcohol that much more available, you have to expect that that's going to have an impact on people's alcohol consumption. And it turns out it has a very substantial impact, particularly on excessive drinking. So, yes? Yeah, hi. And uh, Cindy Whitney from NCIRD. I, I thought it was great how you talked about the broad societal interventions because I'm sure they're the most effective overall, but I was curious if there are smaller scale things that are also effective, things that parents can do, things that schools can do, things that healthcare providers can do to, to reduce mm -hmm. binge drinking. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, well, thanks for the question. Um, yes, the short answer is there definitely is. And I mean, similar to what we've learned about tobacco control, comprehensive programs are definitely the way to go. We put a lot of emphasis on, on policy and environmental work, but there are absolutely things that can be done in the home and, and uh, certainly in healthcare settings. And I would mention in particular screening and brief intervention for excessive alcohol consumption. There's actually a very strong body of literature showing that having a physician or other health professional ask a patient about their drinking behavior and specifically screening for excessive drinking, screening for binge drinking in particular, uh, and then following that by brief what are called motivational interviewing techniques can have quite a significant impact on, um, on changing a patient's drinking behavior. The unfortunate reality is that based on the most recent statistics we have about the extent to which those conversations take place, and the reality is that a lot of times uh, physicians and other health professionals are reluctant to engage in those conversations with their patients. So I think there's a lot more that we need to do to, to get the healthcare system engaged. And um, as I think Dr. Frieden would be very quick to, to remind us, the Affordable Care Act really offers some opportunities to scale up these interventions because of insurance coverage for um, screening and counseling for alcohol misuse. So the opportunity for providers to be reimbursed. Um, so I, I think it's a very important question. And then in terms of parents, the one point I would make there is I think uh, it's critically important for parents to model uh, responsible use of alcohol and, and for all the reasons that we talked about in the presentation. So. Okay, are we out of time? Thanks very much.
thanks, thanks very much to our uh, speakers and to the excellent uh, questions posed. Um, our next session of Grand Rounds will be April 17th at 1 uh, p.m., lymphatic uh, filariasis elimination. Uh, for those of you interested in global tobacco control, that will be featured in Grand Rounds uh, this July. Um, thank you all very much.